This event was sponsored by Spock, the Bootsy Lab for Beautiful Things, PS PDF Kit. With the JavaScript library, you can view and annotate PDF files in the browser. Features include cross-browser support, mobile-optimized UI, and no server-side component. Wild, a digital branding studio, they love GIFs, beer, and weird shit. XXX Lutz, the tech team, XXXL Digital creates all digital experience for XXL Lutz, Mobilix, and Momax all over Europe. OK, first of all, I want to thank uh, Nick and Max for inviting me here today on my way to ReactiveConf. It's really lovely to see all of your faces on this like cold, windy, misty night. It's nice to code on a cold and windy, misty night. Are you ready to make complex and interesting animations in React? Yeah? Yeah? All right. Cool. Um, uh, my name is Sarah. Uh, I, this is my Twitter handle, Sarah Edo. This is also my me as a child and my relationship with authority, my poor mother. Um, I used to be a consultant, which did not mean that I was unemployed. Um, <laughs> I worked for a bunch of these companies, actually all of them. Um, but recently I took a job um, at Microsoft as a senior cloud developer advocate. Um, whoa, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, so that's really exciting. But uh, without further ado, let's dig in. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much. Whoa. <laughs> And I'm easily excited. OK. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here. But before we talk about animating the virtual DOM, it's important to talk about what's changed about the way that the virtual DOM is being rendered. Um, a lot of you probably are familiar with React Fiber. Fiber is a major change to the way that the reconcile Reconciler schedules updates to the renderer. There used to be no preferences given for different kinds of updates. So when data was scheduled over things like animation, you get these kind of pauses and jank in your interface. So in Fiber, animation gets prioritized over less important things, and it's uh, become a first-class citizen. Why is this important? Well, OK, uh, I was at the dentist the other day, uh, and I scheduled a meeting with my dentist before I was supposed to go talk about speaking at an event. The dentist numbed my mouth, and then I went to the appointment. Scheduling updates in the right order ends up being pretty important. If you schedule data before you schedule things like rendering, then you have these pauses in your interface, and you, your, your DOM basically has a like numb face when it's trying to talk. Um, so you, a lot of you are probably thinking, like, why is animation given so much priority? But the thing is, is that any time you're interpolating state or any time you're changing the way that something appears in the DOM, if you change the way that that works for animation, it's kind of like a what's good for, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It means that any kind of rendering is all of a sudden much more performant and makes a lot more sense. So a lot of the stuff that we're covering today, um, it, it still works works in older versions of React, but of course, the later versions of React are going to give you the best performance. So um, I think this quote is great. We've evolved to perform actions that flow more or less seamlessly. We aren't wired to deal with the fits and starts of human computer interaction. This is really true. If you think about people walking into the room net right now, they don't just appear before you in space. That would be a little bit freaky. Um, they usually transition into the room, and you know where they came from. You know where they're going. That's how we've evolved. We've evolved to think that something that just you know, uh, like all of a sudden appears is actually kind of frightening. Um, so, you know, our occipital lobe only has these 100 millisecond bursts. And if we're building for the web, our minds don't really work a different way than that. That is actually what our minds prefer is some sort of transition and interaction. So here's what's particularly exciting. React excels at encapsulating state that's changing. And the whole purpose of animation is tying those two states together. So by not just toggling states and instead exposing the moments in between, we build a story that's less cognitively tasking for our users. It's as if we're telling a story. So in storytelling and in you know, something on the web, we have what's called a so what factor. Our user attention span is really short, and we have to gather their attention very quickly. We have about two seconds before it totally drops off. Amazon's discovered that for every one second delay, conversions drop by 7%. And Walmart's found that for every 1% uh, that it gains 1% revenue increase for every 100 milliseconds of improvement. So what does this have to do with what we're talking about today? Well, 
when we're dealing with animation, we're dealing with perceived performance. So how do we make sure that we're, the mo we're finding the most clear and useful path from one place in our app to the others for our user? Well, one way is to start with the end. If you spend a moment aligning yourselves with what the end goal is, it uh, suddenly offers clarity for what might happen in between. So React brought all of front-end development into a new age by understanding how to re responsibly deal with state. So this is great because we have a record for what's changing in our interfaces. And as a user and a human, you're constantly tracking the space around you. You're creating spatial awareness. What you're seeing here are heat maps of an eye on one web page in particular. You can see that they're not just staying in one spot. They're constantly moving around in an event called saccade. So you do that because you're a predator and you want to look over the entire environment, see if something's moving so you can go eat it. You also are prey. You want to go run away from things that are moving. You're doing that to gather your surroundings. And so things in motion capture your attention the most of anything. That's the reason why those ads with those autoplay videos on the side are really, really annoying when you're trying to read. You have to like disable them, like open Chrome DevTools, delete, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it also means that anything that's changing focus very quickly creates a cognitive load for us. So if the entire team is aligned from beginning to end, you can smooth out that experience for the user. And without that, we really lose an opportunity. The feeling becomes really jarring. And all of a sudden, we have to remap each interactive space as we understand it. It doesn't feel as fluid. It feels more clunky. So here's a great example from Code Drops, where just choosing your seat at a movie theater, you'd be able to gain a real understanding of spatial awareness. And it's really helpful for a user trying to understand a task. If I'm going to pick a seat at a movie theater, it's definitely, if there's two different movie theaters to pick from, and this one I can actually see where I'm going to be sitting, it's definitely going to be this site that I go to or this theater that I go to. Now, I'm biased, of course, because I've been working on this project. Um, but part of the reason why I cleared my schedule to work for Workflow as a client when I was a consultant is because I think this product is so cool for React development. Workflow is a place to manage all your React components. It's a living style guide that gives you a productive environment for building components and showing them to designers and engineers or other engineers and PMs to get on the same page. So we've been talking about connecting states for the user. And this is shown through this walkthrough flow. It uses animation to il illuminate where everything is in the UI and some interactions to highlight where everything lives. Um, the last confirmation screen gives you this like success so you know that you have successfully signed up. So uh, Beget did a great experiment where they have these cu uh, custom loader versus a generic loader. So here we have the kind of custom loader that you're used to. If you grab just like a loader GIF off the internet, you've got this one probably. And they made this custom loader, which actually isn't like that crazy or amazing or anything. It's just a little bit of care. And that little bit of care means that people were willing to wait twice as long on the site while it was loading. People were willing to wait up to 14 seconds for this one and 22 seconds for this one. So just by showing people that you care a little bit, the perceived performance uh, is affected and people will wait for much longer. So I made this, uh, this loader for Smashing Magazine. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Smashing Magazine, but their checkout experience when you buy a book. Um, and it's their Smashing Cat. So uh, they, give me, they gave me an SVG, which I then optimized and started animating. And SVG is actually like, SVG animation is actually really, really good for this kind of animation because that entire SVG and all of the animation involved is only six kilobytes, um, which is pretty good if you're going to animate things on the web. It's actually way more performant than any of those GIFs, which are actually megabytes big. So one of the things I really like about SVG as a format is it's so flexible. It's built with math, so we can manipulate it, make it bounce and snap. I made this animation to honor the yarn release. So I hope I never have to show this slide again. Um, <laughs> I show this slide every time because people still think that SVG is not well supported. Look at all that green. We got Opera Mini. We never get Opera Mini, right? <laughs> <laughs> And this actually goes back to IE9, and there's partial support in IE8. So you can definitely use SVG. And you especially if you don't like positioning things in CSS, because I'm going to take a super brief detour here to clarify what scalable means when we refer to scalable vector graphics. 
Here you can see when we place the graphic directly in line in the HTML, it has width and height, and it constrains. But then if you take those <coughs> out, the graphic takes up the whole screen. So it will constrain to the proportions of anything you put it in. So be it grid, or flexbox, or percentage, it doesn't matter. But the innards stay totally consistent within themselves. So if you don't like positioning crazy things for responsive in CSS, SVG might be your answer because it stays totally stable and you can still manipulate it. OK, so now we've talked about why it's effective to animate in React. Let's get into some nitty gritty of code details and how you can actually put this into your site. So uh, when working with an animation, we can start to think about certain aspects of the way that we build out our components as the pieces that we'd like to iterate on. Or in this case, with the sound visualization, um, I want to alter things like the timing of the entrance and the timing of the exit, and so on and so forth. So we'll go into more detail about how we built the animation for this component a bit later. But this is an important piece of choreography, thinking about things like timing and eases as things we can easily change in conjunction with an entrance or exit. And timing is incredibly important. Timing's p pivotal for jokes, for introductions. This is a really bad dark UX pattern, where as soon as you visit group on site, this modal comes up and blocks you from doing anything else. I'm just like visiting the site for the first time. I don't know anything about them. And it's like, hey, like maybe buy me a drink first. Um, <laughs> if you think I'm being picky, know that Google agrees and will now drop your SEO for any timed interstitial on mobile. So this is documentary footage of me trying to use that site. Someone put a camera on me at the time. I don't know. Um, but the funniest part is we already are used to thinking about creating beautiful defaults. We already build apps this way with text and layout. Uh, we use props this way all the time, but we don't typically do it with animation. We do a lot of reinventing the wheel when it comes to animation. It makes it much harder for us to put into production sites. So one way that we can fix this is to create beautiful defaults for animation. And why should we do that? It seems like a lot of work. Who cares? Well, it's, any, it's like any other technical debt. If you do a little bit of work up front, it's way easier to build and iterate in a cohesive ma manner. So we can create these defaults for easing things like entrance, exit, entrance emphasis for times when you're saying like a success or something, um, and entry. Uh, em an, em an exit emphasis um, so that you get a similar kind of feeling across your site and you never have to remember it again, right? Like you get these things put into your code base and then you know you're plugging into entrance. You know you're plugging into exit. All of your eases say totally consistent across the entire site. So this really helps on teams that aren't totally into animation. They can still build out animations. They're not prohibited from doing so. And so if you have stuff like H1, H2 for body, you know, and H5 is your typical body copy, think about your timing the same way. T1, T2, T3, T5 is your typical one. So you, you're already almost there to building out every animation. You plug into H or to T5 every time, you plug into entrance, and you've already started. If it looks a little funny and you need it to be faster or slower, you just change it from T to T4 or T3. So Creating these beautiful defaults help, helps us not just have to reinvent the animation wheel. We have way less to think about, and then we can decide what kind of animation we're using rather than adjusting timing and easing all over the place like we normally do. So I think about a more common UX example here. Let's say we're building out a card, and we can create some components where we're putting these pieces together and even adding a specific animation, that uh, uh, a specific animation component that kind of handles the entrances and exits for no matter what's going inside of there. I should have sped up this animation. <laughs> So I'll show you how I created the entrance and, e uh, and exit co coordinating React transition group in Greensock a little further into this talk. But you can see that no matter what's going inside of there, the animation is always going to be consistent. So animating React is actually a giant landscape, because React has a beautiful and wonderful ecosystem. 
but we're not going to get to talk about all of these things today. You know, we're not going to be able to talk a lot about, you know, Canvas and React Conva and Ken Wheeler and Guns and Beer Stank <laughs> and things like that. We're going to stick more towards the DOM side of things um, because that's kind of your typical use case. And we're going to talk more about React Transition Group and Mo.js and GreenSock. So let's start with Mo.js. It's one library that I really like working with. And the thing that I like about it is you don't even have to open up a graphics editor if you don't want to. It has built-ins like bursts and swirls. And you can use them with just one line of code, as you can see here. And it comes with a ton of SVG shapes built in, so you don't even have to be fluent in SVG like I am in order to build things. You can just hook into all of these shapes and write them very, very declaratively. So I can apply those to those burst and swirl animations like I did on my site for when people, you know, log in or when people want to contact me. And I use a slew of these shapes to as children of the burst. And within a couple of minutes, I'm able to spin up some pretty fun feedback on this button. So I decided to create something that's open source that you can dig into Mo.js in React. And of course, I pick the thing that's the most useful to you, which is exploding hot dogs. Um, <laughs> so you should definitely take <coughs> make good use of this OSS contribution. Um, <laughs> probably the most important piece of this whole demo, actually, that I should call out to you is that Mo.js really performs the best if you return false on sh should component update. React Motion is a really beautiful way of animating in React, but it's different from the things that we looked at earlier because the in before we were looking at things like timing. And React Motion doesn't work with the idea of time. It's similar to game-based animation. So it's interruptible. You get this beautiful cascading values because in staggering animation, one piece is updated from another and in, in, in essence gets it that gets that motion for free. So you're doing these single movements that are really, really beautiful. Um, it's basically this idea of giving something mass and physics and sending on its way. Um, because of this, it's very, very good for these kind of like native app kind of animations. It's not good for sequential movement where you're layering one thing on top of another, like a dog going for a walk or something. Um, it's better for something like a chat head moving around your screen or something. Of course, we don't only need to do these huge movements either. In this example, we have a layout with small staggering animations when we click on the circles, as well as hover effects for text elements. And since we're using SVG, it's so easy to make it scale for responsive on mobile without any positioning craziness. And in those circles that we're updating with a click, we're using a staggered motion component to use the previous styles to update the next one's placement. And in the component itself, which you can see is actually a staggered motion component, that's how you'd use it, uh, we pass an array of path values, giving each path a key, and we update that opacity. Here's another example of React Motion at work. We're updating many parts of an SVG, some with rotation and some drawing these letters onto the page. But uh, that drawing the uh, uh, SVG onto the page isn't you know, only something that you can do in React Motion. I'm going to teach you how to do that right now. Um, so let's say you have a shape, and let's say that that shape is dashed. That's just a path with a dash around it. Well, you can make that dash really, really long, and the dash offset, the space between those shapes, is an animatable property in CSS. So you can use any kind of way to animate this. You can use CSS, you can use React Motion, you can use GreenSock, you can use Request Animation Frame, what have you. So I've already console logged the, the length of all of the letters, and 200 is the maximum length. So here I can use a ternary to toggle and therefore draw the length of the shape onto the page. And that's how I created the animation for Trulia's responsive navigation. We have React Motion updating the stroke around the nav icon on hover, and then on click we transform the other pieces to make an X and open the nav. And you can see how fluid that motion is back and forth. So I'm not saying you have to follow what I say, uh, but I experiment a lot with animation technologies, and I play with all of them. So I thought I would just give you my recommendations for the job so that you don't have to play with all of them in order to get going if you don't want to. Um, OK, 
So let's break some stuff down. Uh, CSS and JS or styles or CSS, however you style things. Um, it's really, really good for small sequences and simple interactions because you don't have to load any other library or anything. It's very, very cheap and affordable to do so. It's a very declarative way of um, creating animations. But in order to create sequences that are a bit more complex, uh, um, what you end up having to do is you're staggering based on ba staggering these animations based on a delay. So every time you chain them, you chain another delay, which means if you need to change the timing of something, you have to go update all of those values, which is very imperative. Um, so once you get to three chained animations, once you get to some more complex kind of movement, then I would consider moving over to GreenSock. And we're going to talk a lot about GreenSock for the end of this. Um, it's really great for co sequencing complex movement, and it's really, really good for cross-browser consistency. And that's probably the biggest reason that I use GreenSock, is that if you're updating a production site, I never have my code all of a sudden break, or I never find some weird use case on mobile or anything, because they're looking out for you, and they're kind of adjusting the spec for you. Uh, React Motion, as you saw, is really beautiful for single movements you'd like to make look realistic. Um, it's not as good at those chained sequential in interactions, but those single movements that are based on gesture, it really excels at. React Tween is similar to React Motion, except you're using time instead of spring, so you're still using those components. That can be really, really nice. But if you're, again, if you're layering too many of them, then you've got component after component after component. So again, if you get to more than three sequences that are on top of one another, I might suggest switching over to GreenSock. And React Move is similar to React Motion, except it's a little bit more flexible. It's smaller, but it doesn't include things like timing or sequencing. You add that you know, based on your needs. Uh, Snap SVG is not an animation library. Uh, people often ask me about that because I work with SVG a lot. It's more like the jQuery of SVG. It has a lot of like DOM manipulation on SVG. And in fact, if you go to their demos page, all of their demos are written in CSS um, for the animation. Um, because Dmitry Baranovsky says like that's not really the right tool for that job. And I asked him what he suggests for animation, and he says GreenSock. Um, so just letting you know that part. Uh, web animation API looks great. It's really promising. I think it probably is the future of the web, again, because you don't have to load any external resources. But it's still being worked on, which means that even with a polyfill, the polyfill breaks. And I wouldn't put that in a production site unless you really like pager duty. It's a thing that you're really into. You like being called. You like feeling important when it goes off. Um, <laughs> um, Velocity React is similar to uh, GSAP without a lot of the bells and whistles. I ran some tests a few years back that showed that performance was a little lacking on there. But those were two years old now. And that I think the web years are like dog years. So that's like 14 years ago now. So you should definitely be running those tests yourself. There's been a lot of work on that library since, uh, since I ran those tests. Mo.js, as you saw, spins up shapes declaratively. And it's still in beta. But I really love it. I think it's worth playing around with. So one library that again and again shines when I want to create beautiful movement in React, and it's GreenSock. It's been under devel development for 10 years, and it has a ton of offerings. And I think the real reason that I use it is it's very tough to find something that another tool can do that GSAP can't do, but there are plenty of things that GSAP can do that other tools can't. So let's dig into those for a minute. So to show you some of the capabilities here, we're going to dig into transforms, cross-browser inconsistencies, morphing, and sequencing and chaining. So many of you are probably already aware, but just in case you aren't, um, in terms of animation on the web, not all properties are created equal. Opacity and transforms cause the l least amount of repaints. You shouldn't be moving things with margins or transforms. Um, that causes like a lot of browser jank and things like that. Uh, so there are also ways to hardware accelerate in, um, in CSS or with request animation frame even. Um, you use these properties. One is called the null transform hack, which is that Z um, uh, zero on the translate Z, backface visibility hidden, and perspective 1000. I have some resources, and so do the Chrome Dev uh, teams if you want to know more about that. So since we have to move things with transforms, it's really important to address what happens when you work with transforms. Well, if you work with transforms a lot, um, what ends up happening is you want something like this where a bunch of things are moving all concurrently together. But what ends up happening is this. 
because there's a layer for those stacking transforms. So they keep on layering one after another. They wait for each other to finish. One way of working around this is to write subsequent divs or components all around each other, and then that's kind of messy and not perfect, right? Um, another way of dealing with this is to in write out each single one on each single keyframe step, which means that you're actually like manually interpolating these states, which is super clunky, right? Like if I get one of these wrong, it looks like it pauses or goes slower or faster in one of these. Um, so what I really like about Greensock is that we write these like this instead. We no longer have to write transform. Oh, oh, sorry, my slides are all over the place. Um, that we no longer have to write transform, translate x, transform, translate y. They're all moving in the DOM using matrix calculations. So we're allowed to manipulate each one separately. Now, to be clear, you can write matrix calculations with things like React Motion, React Move, any one of those, but writing matrix transforms by hand is not like my favorite activity. Maybe it's yours, but it's, it's a little bit complicated and not that intuitive. And the nice thing about working with GreenSock, too, is that it really is happy to just make numbers move. So we can animate the unanimatable like you just saw there with uh, SVG filters, because SVG filters aren't part of the CSS spec. They're not an animatable property, but all of a sudden we can make ripples in a pond move. Ah. It also solves cross-browser inconsistencies. This one's fun. Um, <laughs> uh, SVG DOM nodes on, uh, are not even animatable in IE yet. I hope that they are soon. Firefox, come on, like what? They said that they fixed it and then they didn't. It made me cry. Um, so yeah, all of these kind of things uh, really do and add up. As soon as you start animating something, if you're working with GreenSock, it just behaves the way that it should and it behaves on all browsers the way that it should. And they correct the spec. This is actually the way that the spec thinks you want stacked transforms to work. That's nuts. That is nuts. That's not what I want. <laughs> um, so GreenSock does things like the one on the left, where it kind of corrects for the spec involvement and makes these calculations under the hood so that it's not creating these crazy, like, what the fuck um, kind of things. It also allows us to do things like morph SVG, which is a really cool thing where you can pass just one ID to another from any SVG path value. So you can make them morph from one to another. But on top of that, they allow you to pick the index of where it's morphing to. So not only can you animate different types of path values, you can take them from any index and you can see how different that movement is based on where that index is. So stuff like that really makes a difference when you're working with animation. So we can make things like a fire and a candle with math on the web and have it be four kilobytes. And we can make smoke. So sequencing and chaining is one of my favorite parts of uh, GreenSock. So let's talk about that before we close up. Um, it's easy to make really, really spaghetti code when you're sequencing and chaining. You end up getting into things like callback hell, or you're you know, creating things with based off of delays. Um, but GreenSock offers you a timeline that allows you to just uh, all of a sudden manipulate all of those, which is really, really cool. So when we're working with a timeline, basically, oh. My slides are like, the demo gods hate me today. OK, um, we can stack tweens. We can change their placement in time. We can group them into scenes. We can add relative labels. Re relative labels would be like inserting into the playhead right here. I want a bunch of things to fire right off of that event so that if anything changes before that in the timeline, they're always going to stay together no matter what happens, even if you manipulate timing. I keep talking about manipulating timing. That's because if you're working with animation, that's all you do. That's all animators do. We don't do anything else. We're not actually playing with like making things move across the screen. We're just changing the timing and changing the easing over and over and over again. So this is a really, really big deal. We can also animate the scenes. You can animate your animations. Um, you can, wow, I'm throwing things. I'm so excited. Um, you can reuse the scenes. You can play them backwards. You can pause them. 
And so you can create these really beautiful effects, like this one from Leo Long. Uh, we, we talked about creating a seamless transition from the beginning to the end of a user journey. And so we'll find the end of that story and make sure that the transitions uh, go from one state to another as seamlessly as possible. You can see some nice morphing of that button from a circle to a rectangle, as well as how the layout has to move over, and a few other things that really need to be coordinated in time. Um, in figuring out how to do so, you can take screenshots of your existing site, that, you know, that first state and the second state, and you can create small storyboards of your existing designs and find similar enough elements that can simply be altered instead of completely changed in order to transition them. So React Transition Group Plus is really great for working with GreenSock and React. Remember, I, I mentioned how great GreenSock is, but I didn't, usually, I didn't talk about how I usually pair that with React. Well, I coordinate uh, entrances and exits with this thing called React Transition Group Plus. It's not the same thing as React Transition Group. It's similar. Um, but what it does is it offers us these hooks to work with. So here's a comparison of React Transition Group and React Transition Group Plus. We have something called transition modes. It's pretty common in an accordion or navigation or other parts of your RUI that we're not just making an entrance and exit, but we're coordinating something leaving and entering at the same time. So we can state without a bunch writing a bunch of callbacks whether we want these two actions to happen simultaneously or if we'd like one thing to enter and finish entering and then the other one to just come in. And this is a really common use case. We no longer have to reinvent the wheel. So these are actually two elements. When I'm clicking on this, this is two elements, but it looks like one because by using those transition modes, they can seamlessly change. One of them can transition out while the other one transitions in, and it looks like one continuous movement. And without those, we kind of lose an opportunity because what ends up happening is they both fire at once and one is already done transitioning when the other one appears. It's not a big one in this case, but it does make a difference in terms of fluidity. So we can encapsulate what's changing with this thing that I made that shows page transitions. So uh, in this example, I'm using this idea of screens. When we click on the button, we advance the screen, looping around and coming back to the first. And each screen, we fire a function that handles our animation separately. So in the in then we hang a timeline off of that function so we can choreograph and finely tune the way that that movement works. The event was simply our hook. And so, oh, sorry, go back. And uh, one other thing that's really nice about GreenSock is it allows us to have this thing called clear props, which allows us to unset inline styles that have been placed directly on the element itself so that if we need to transition them, if we need to move those things in particular, it can take them off right before it transitions them. And so we'll revisit that first example. You can now guess how we created that animation. We worked with GreenSock's timeline to draw those pieces of the SVG on and hooked into the transition component, like comp uh, component will enter and component will leave in React Transition Group Plus, and that schedules the timeline calls. So there's tons more things you can do with it, too, that I didn't get to cover. There's draggable, motion along a path, custom easing, physics, and throw props. Really, the sky's the limit. React is awesome at encapsulating the state that's changing, and animation is really good at bringing those two states together for the user. With those two things put together, we ah, with those thing, two things put together, we can really start to make really fluid interfaces that are beautifully choreographed for the web. Um, I wrote a book that's not this book. This is my friend trolling me. I don't have the man blob animal, and uh, my, that's not even my last name. Uh, <laughs> um, this is my book. Um, it's available on O'Reilly from O'Reilly. Um, I also do these web animation workshops with Val Head, um, and we're, we came to Paris this year. We're probably going to come back to London next year if you want to attend those. And thank you.